Hi, welcome. I uh, hope everyone's enjoying EMF. <laughs> it's the Sunday. Uh, I'm really excited to be giving my first talk at EMF, and I'm also balancing that against the sleep deprivation. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Um, right, so um, as I was introduced, I'm going to talk a bit about CERN technology. So a lot of people ask, um, you know, well, CERN costs an awful lot of money. Where does all that money go? It's blue sky particle physics. How does it affect me? There's a huge amount of technology required to build the most complicated machine in the world. And that technology filters out into all aspects of our daily lives. And so we'll see some of that in the talk today. Um, so just uh, to give a quick agenda, um, I should say first, there's not going to be heavy physics in here. Although my original training was a physicist, I've defected to engineering. So <laughs> there's, uh, there's no Higgs bosons and all, all diagrams of that. It's a high-level overview of how particle accelerators work, what's at CERN, um, not just the LHC, uh, and where the technology, uh, technology goes. So uh, myself, I'm currently a beam instrumentation engineer at CERN. Um, and I work on the beam position monitors. So inside this blue pipe uh, is a cryogenic magnet, and inside that uh, there's two smaller pipes which take two beams that go opposite directions around, and then occasionally we smash them into each other and see what fundamental particles are produced. And we do this really, really fast, 40 million times a second. We crash them, uh, and that builds up statistical data which we can use to prove existences of particles and different theories. Um, so... We need to make sure where those beams are, we need to check that they're in the middle of the pipe when we want them to be there, and, and how to move them. So that's what the, the job I do, as I do the, it's the end of the stage, the electronics <laughs> for uh, working out where they are. Before then, I did a similar job at Diamond Light Source, which is the UK's particle accelerator, the, the main one uh, near Oxford, uh, and you'll hear a bit about that later. Uh, I've got a doctorate in microwave engineering, um, and this is uh, more of radio antennas rather than cooking your meals uh, late at night, but um, I can maybe try and fix those two. Um, important to note, this is not an official CERN talk, as probably seen by my uh, gym or paint it t-shirt. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of CERN, but uh, it's all good things. So, <laughs> so um, a bit about what is CERN, how accelerators work, the accelerator CERN has. Uh, the technology that's been developed there, as I said. Um, there's two job adverts at the end. Uh, um, I'll, in, ca in case I get cut off, <laughs> um, please see me afterwards if you're interested. Um, I have the JD on the NFC tag, so you can just scan my badge and have a read of it. What is CERN? So, it's located in Geneva, Switzerland, as I'm sure a lot of you know. You get this beautiful view when you uh, leave work every day, unless it's rainy and cloudy, which it also is a lot of the time. Um, and in, the real main thing about CERN is it's international. Um, it's not just European, it's based in Europe, but we have collaborations all around the world. Um, and uh, it's, so it's the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or the French version of that word. And the reason it's CERN is originally it was the Council. But the acronym OERN doesn't sound very good, so they kept the C uh, for when they do the acronym. So uh, 23 main member states, 11 associate members, and then the USA and Japan are observers, all just to do with the financial arrangements. But on top of that, we have separate collaborations with all, all sorts of other countries too. So it's a very, very broad remit. Um, and fundamentally, it's all about international collaboration um, and providing instruments that no single country could afford. Um, so the formation of it was just after the Second World War. So there was a mass exodus of talent during the war in Europe, uh, mainly over to the USA. Um, and so Europe really needs to build its uh, uh, prevalence again for science. And Louis de Broglie, um, who was, uh, came up with the wave particle um, duality uh, uh, physics, uh, decided to, that they would do something about that. And they convinced UNESCO, which is the UN's educational scientific body, um, to persuade 12 countries to become founding members. And they formed CERN in 1953 with a civil mandate. So no military research whatsoever, which is a very important thing uh, after those years. Um, and that's still very much still the case. Um, they built the site for the accelerators um, in a small town near Geneva, uh, right next to Geneva. Um, but soon the site got bigger, and it's on the border, so it expanded across into France. Um, and again, this core international thing, it's separated from political boundaries. So even in the Cold War, um, Soviet and Western scientists were collaborating through CERN. Um, so it was very, very powerful for that. 
So, particle accelerators 101. This is probably what you're here for, to hear about particle accelerators. How do we accelerate particles? Well, first we need a charged particle source. We use fields to accelerate charged particles. So this could be electrons, it could be protons, it could be ions, which can be either atoms or molecules um, with a, a, an extra electron or missing one, so they're positive or negatively charged. We have an accelerating potential shown in yellow. Um, this, because uh, you have opposite charges attract, so we can have an oppositely charged plate. This will uh, pull the electrons off uh, and accelerate them. Uh, we need a vacuum. If we don't have a vacuum, all of the air molecules will create barriers for these accelerated particles. They'll hit them, they'll get deflected, they won't go where we want them. So we have to have a very strong vacuum, similar to the vacuum of space. Uh, and then we need, um, the other problem we have is we've, we don't just get one particle at a time from our source, we get quite a lot. And these are all like charges, they're the same charge, and so they repel. So as they're travelling along, they're going to be trying to smear out. And that's not what we want. We want to have a nice beam that we can steer where we want it to go. So we have to focus the beam. We have to pull that back in again. And we use magnets for that. The reason we use magnetic fields, not electric fields, is because in most accelerators, you need a stronger force to do this. And you can only get that from the magnetic coils. But we'll see an exception in a second. And then finally, we need some deflecting magnets, or bending magnets as we call them, uh, to aim it wherever we want to put the beam. So the different classes of accelerator we have, um, you can sort them by linear and circular, and then by low and high energy. So in the first top left here, we have an electron gun. This is the same thing you have in the back of your CRT television, if you still have, well, there's lots of them here today. Um, so, um, uh, with these linear machines, you don't recycle the beam. So any accelerating you're doing, you have to do in that structure. Um, with a circular machine, you feed it back on itself and you can add to the energy each time. And we'll see later how that means you can get much more powerful machines. Um, if you want to go up in energy from the electron gun, you add more accelerating structures and then this turns into something we generally call a linear accelerator or a LINAC for short. Uh, and then for the circular machines, we start off with something called a cyclotron. Um, this is uh, an interesting machine we'll see in the next slide. Uh, I won't explain it on this slide. Um, and then uh, for more higher energies, we go into a synchrotron, uh, which is basically a linear accelerator that we take and we wrap it around so it feeds back on itself. Uh, if you want, so uh, quite often these machines feed into each other to make the bigger ones. So a synchrotron is fed by a linear accelerator, which gets its particles from an electron gun. Sometimes we need an even bigger synchrotron, so we shove one on the end. Uh, and then it's, you know, synchrotrons all the way down. So, so let's uh, have a quick look at guns, uh, electron guns, not, not uh, other guns. Um, so there's two main types, thermionic and, and photoelectric. Thermionic is what everyone will be used to. It's effectively a light bulb. It gets very, very hot, boils off electrons. This is what you have in your TV. And they then get attracted by the accelerating uh, fields uh, that I mentioned. Uh, there's a diagram of one up on the top right there. Uh, also, there was photoelectric, which is a more modern system using accelerators, where you shine a laser into the pipe uh, onto a special uh, metal alloy, and this uh, uses a different physics effect to cause the, the photoelectric effect to cause the uh, electrons to come off. So, um, uh, in addition to just producing electrons, um, we can also produce heavier particles such as protons and ions. And for this, we either use an ionized gas. And here we have a picture of the hydrogen gas bottle, which is used at one of the CERN's uh, big uh, linear accelerators, uh, which we use for that. Um, all from uh, very funky liquid metal uh, solutions, uh, which gives us all sorts of exotic uh, ions as well that we can use. Um, so as I said, on their own, they're used in, in lower energy devices like cathode ray tubes, scanning electron microscopes, uh, and other um, science equipment. Typical energy, 500, uh, 50 to 100 keV. CERN has one up to 500 keV. What's a keV? So, uh, when we measure the energy of a beam, if we were to do it in joules, which is the SI unit for energy, it would be a very, very low number. So instead what we do is we say, well, what energy do we need to accelerate one electron, or proton, because they have the same charge, um, across a potential of one volt? And that is one electron volt. So if we have two plates and we charge them to a megavolt, a million volts, then when a particle has gone between them, it's gained one mega electron volt of energy. So this is how those uh, quantities work. 
So a quick example of a gun, cathode ray tube television. So it's very simple, you have an electron gun at one end. This has, we boil off the electrons here, we accelerate them towards a, an electrode of the opposite charge. Um, this is actually our focusing coil. In a CRT, because it's very low energy, we use electric fields to do that focusing, not magnetic, but that's really the only exception. Um, and then we use steering magnets, and this scans, does what's called a raster scan of the electron beam across the screen, and that draws the image. Cyclotrons. So this is one of the earliest forms of particle accelerator, and it's very neat, compact, clever design. What we do is rather, in order to confine the beam and not have to have a very long machine, we can have a magnetic field that our accelerator is between. And this will cause any electron or charged particle that's moving to have a curved path. They'll keep turning in that field. Now, if we keep accelerating it, it forms a spiral. And once it gets to full energy, we have a hole in the side of our accelerating cavity and the beam fires out. And you can see in this animation here. So to do the accelerating, we have these two uh, what are called copper Ds. They're hollow D-shaped electrodes. Um, a bit like if you take a baby bell and you take the cheese out and it's the two red bits at the end. Uh, so cheesy Ds. So, <laughs> so we apply the alternating field across these and you can see that the way the timing works is that you attract the, uh, the charge to its opposite uh, uh, charge, opposite field, just as it goes across that gap. Um, so this is very, very useful. And also, the clever thing with these um, cyclotrons is the way the timing works is as it goes quicker, it does a longer path, but as it's going quicker, it gets there at the same time. So um, that means that it, it's always in the correct phasing when it hits the, the gap there. Um, this is uh, Ernest Lawrence who actually designed the first uh, cyclotron, and this is one of the, the, the first large one that they built. Um, and he's, his namesake is Lawrence Livermore Labs over in the US, uh, where they then continued with this. Um, so this, uh, you can see, is also fairly low energy, 500 MeV. Um, but Japan's just built a huge one that goes up to 82 GeV. So maybe my table is a little bit wrong now, but generally. Uh, let me go to Linux. So we can use multiple accelerating cavities to keep increasing the speed each time. Um, we need to do this because when you have your electric field between two plates, as you've seen from the Tesla coil down in the field, if you get to a certain voltage, the air breaks down. But we don't have air, we have a vacuum. It still breaks down. It's at a much higher voltage, but it will still break down. You'll get a gathering of ions towards the plates, um, and then that's enough to cause this breakdown. What we can do instead is we can add more sections um, at a lower voltage, but also if we apply an alternating current, um, which ends up being at radio frequencies, uh, we can actually cause these ions to not build up. They sort of smear out because there's no net charge to keep these ions building up near the plates. Um, and so this is how a LINAC works. As you can see, we fire our particle in um, and it gains speed each time. Because these are heavy particles like protons, we have to keep making our tubes longer and longer because that's, that arc we had in the cyclotron was getting longer and longer. We now need to make our tubes longer and longer uh, to still be at the right timing here. Um, this is an example of a LINAC uh, at Diamond Light Source where I was working. And there's a really cool feature here. But as I was saying, for protons, they get faster and faster. For electrons, within the first sort of 70 centimeters of this LINAC machine, which is maybe the first couple of accelerating cavities, it's already traveling at 99.9999 times the speed of light. When you give that more energy, it doesn't go faster, it gets heavier, which is a really weird thing, but it's special relativity due to this cheeky chappy. And the amazing thing from our engineering point of view is this part of the accelerator, which is lots and lots and lots of little cavities, they don't have to get longer anymore because it's not going faster. So this is a rare case where special relativity has made our lives easier because we can make the same part and assemble it together. It's, uh, yeah, very strange. And then, uh, so these can go up to 200 MeV, um, just to give you some ratios. Synchrotrons, so it's like a LINAC, but we bend it back on itself. Um, the benefit with synchrotrons is we can also make them very large. You can only make those big copper baby bell things a certain size, and then they get very unwieldy, and you'll see some pictures of that soon. Um, with the synchrotron, we can make it a lot bigger. We can add as many sections as we want. Um, it's not a circle. It's made up of straight sections, which have accelerating structures and focusing magnets. And then we have specific bending magnets to then join all of those together. 
Um, this one you can see is fed by a Linac and another little synchrotron called a booster before it goes in. Um, and this is actually showing what's called a light source, which you'll see shortly, where we take the beam that's in this machine, electrons, and we wiggle them with other magnets, and that produces bright X-ray light, which um, uh, scientists can then use to probe matter uh, and uh, drug effectiveness and things like that. Um, because we go up to higher energies with these machines, because each time it goes round, we can give it another kick. We can put some accelerating cavities in and kick it each time. So we can get up to high energies. Um, and because of that, there are certain other effects called instabilities that happen when these beams get very energetic. Um, they start seeing the pipe that they're going through, and that starts making them wobble a bit. Formal technical language. Um, so <laughs> So um, we have to start adding more magnets and it starts getting more complicated. But this is something that we do. Um, and so these can go up very high. 14 tera electron volts, which is an awesome unit. Um, and that's what we have for the Large Hadron Collider. So some quick uses. Televisions, mentioned before, this is the electron gun out the back of one. Um, synchrotron light sources, diamond I worked before. It's not GCHQ, uh, <laughs> it's the other donut. Uh, in Oxford, um, and uh, I don't think they tap your calls there, but I wasn't let into that room. Um, and then this is an example of one of the beam lines that come off, where the x-rays come through, and this is a cool automated one where the robot will take samples, put it in the beam, and then they'll see where the x-rays get diffracted, and then they can work out what the chemical makeup of certain proteins and, and drugs are. Um, so then we also have um, medical imaging. So Sometimes um, you'll have to have, or hopefully you'll never have to have one, but for example, a PET scan uh, to try and see where you have, if you've got certain things wrong with you, they have to do a type of medical imaging where they inject a radioactive tracer into your body, you drink this substance, and then they take a picture of you um, with a machine that's sensitive to that. Um, so they have to make these radioactive substances. They have a very short half-life, so they don't last very long in your body, just long, to, long enough to do the test. And so they do that, and in some hospitals, they will have particle accelerators, which they will put to target. Uh, this is a, a cyclotron. We saw a picture of one earlier. This, this is where the baby bells are. And it revs it up, and then it will uh, irradiate these targets, um, which then makes them uh, you know, able to drink and perform the, the PET scan. Um, they also can be a bit bigger, uh, and that's an example of one of the targets that they can use. Um, radiotherapy, so this is where you put targeted particle beams to try and attack cancers and other issues. Um, there's some big advances at that at the moment. This is Harley Street in London. So you can be walking along the high street in London and there's a particle accelerator underground. Um, this is for a new proton therapy system. Um, there's smaller units. Um, this is a Linac. We saw Linac earlier. There's one built in the top of the gantry. There's a bending magnet to loop it round. Uh, and then it goes through various focusing equipment uh, onto the table where the patient is. And then on the right-hand side here, this is a huge proton therapy center. You've got a synchrotron in the top left there, and then the beams come along, and you can pick which room you're sending the beam to. And then this thing here is a giant set of bending magnets on a gimbal that allows you to direct the beam wherever you want, uh, which is really quite impressive. Um, what's weird is that the treatment rooms look really, really sleek and lovely and calm, and professional. Behind the wall is this, um, <laughs> uh, the, the particle accelerator. So, but yeah, it's all very safe and, uh, and it all does the job. And finally, fundamental physics. This is what CERN really does. So atom smashers, smashing particles together to find out how the universe works. And effectively, we get them very, very, very high energy. And then we have very complicated cameras with many, many sensors, many pixels. Yeah, it's hard to make pixels when it's the size of a cavern, so your pixels get quite big, um, but the engineering is staggering. Uh, the the, the fibre data streams that have to come out, um, all the events 40 million times a second, they have to have fast trigger systems to decide whether they want to keep that data. Was it a good capture? No? Okay, let's throw it away. So um, there's all sorts of systems there that I can't go into today. Accelerator complex at CERN. So what do we have at CERN? Quick whirlwind tour. Linear accelerators is where everything starts. We either have protons produced, which is most of the run in a CERN year is, is proton physics. This comes into uh, a booster, which then goes into the proton synchrotron. 
Now these machines you'll see in a sec were all made at different times of, uh, of the last century. So um, CERN started with Proton Booster, then it added a PS, then it added an SPS, and so the machines feed the next one along generally. Um, what we can also do if we're doing ion physics with heavy, for example, lead ions, which we do near the end of the year for a bit, um, LINAC 3 produces those. They get revved up in this low energy ion ring. They then go into the proton synchrotron. All of that then goes into the super proton synchrotron, uh, which is seven kilometers. That's so a big machine already. Um, and then that can feed the Large Hadron Collider. You'll see there's also a lot of other stuff going on at CERN. We have what's called fixed target physics, where we just put beams into fixed targets rather than against each other. So we have all these other areas which these machines can feed. Um, how this works, generally, uh, scheduling-wise, is that um, the machine will rev up its particles, it will fill the next ring, and while that ring is revving up its load of particles, this will be producing beam for the other experiments. So there's a very clever scheduling system that switches all the different magnets around all these different sets of points and switch yards to do all of that. It's very, very clever. So, CERN accelerators. Synchrocyclotron. That's a cool word. It's huge, isn't it? I've told you about synchrotrons and cyclotrons, so let's have one of them together. Why is it called that? This is the first one they built at CERN in 57, um, and it replaced another one that was, at, it was underneath the cathedral in Liverpool. Which is, I mean, yeah, <laughs> symbolism and stuff, I don't know. It's because they had a lot of space. This cathedral was built smaller than it was supposed to be, but the crypt was huge, and they built the foundations the full size. The university was down the road, so that's, that's what they say. Um, so, um, this generally replaced that machine. A lot of scientists were working on that, moved over. Um, the reason it's a synchrocyclotron, I mentioned before the cyclotron, as the particles get to the gap between the baby bells, the uh, radio frequency is just the right phase. Um, I also mentioned with the Linux that if we have a, uh, a very heavy particle like a proton, um, the length of the tubes get bigger and also as they approach the speed of light, you find that they get more massive rather than faster. Um, the cyclotron can't handle that. Um, uh, it would, what you would need to do as they get around uh, big heavier and go to the edge you have to slow down the radio frequency, you have to sweep it down to a lower frequency. And that's what this does. But because it's synchronized, it's called a synchro cyclotron. Um, so that was the first unit. They then built the proton synchrotron and, uh, and booster, which you can see here. Um, this is the proton synchrotron. Um, this is the booster that feeds it, uh, which was built a bit later when they also introduced uh, an intersecting storage ring. This was the first collider at CERN. Um, this is a rare because it's one of the units that aren't still used at CERN. It's the only ring that is now just an empty tunnel for storing old equipment. Um, but they added the booster to get higher energies for that. The booster is really cool. It's actually four rings stacked on each other, and you can see the four beams. And then, for example, the bending magnets are just common between those, those four beams. So, uh, just to show you how complicated it is, this is the layout of the proton synchrotron and its booster. You can see the Linux down here. This is an old picture, so it's got Linux 2. We've replaced that with Linux 4 now. The beam comes in, it goes into the booster, whizzes around, gets energy, it gains more energy, then it goes into the proton synchrotron, and from there, it goes off into the super proton synchrotron, or to other places. We've got a very complicated switch yard here that allows us to change the beam uh, locations, but also you'll notice there's this really interesting crossover part. And also, we have to take this single beam, turn it into four beams in the booster. When it comes out the booster, it has to get merged back into one. So we have this thing. So that's a plan view, and then this is a photo from inside. So the beam comes in from the LINAC on the right, and then it has this uh, system, which is a, a big magnet, which basically sprays the beam across. So it starts off, it hits an absorber, it then manages to go down the first pipe into the first machine, another absorber, second pipe, third, fourth. So this gives four slightly offset beams traveling around the booster. When they finish, they come in off the page here, they get merged into two. This bit's amazing because you've got four beam pipes and another two that fit through. It's very, very complicated for, for particle accelerators. <laughs> And so it then comes through here and gets merged again off screen. 
Um, the merging is very easy because they've already been spaced out equally by this distributor. So you just have to uh, connect them back together again. But it's a really crazy bit of engineering uh, to make that work. Super Proton Synchrotron, this was opened in 1976. It's the first really big machine, seven kilometer circumference. It crosses the French Swiss border and is fed by the proton synchrotron, as we said. We go up to 450 giga electron volts. So this is really some serious energy here. This was run as a standalone machine for uh, well over 10 years. It, it was responsible for the discovery of W and Z bosons. So these are really significant parts of the standard model of particles that describe the universe at the moment. Um, and responsible for sort of electroweak interactions. Um, and so, in, from an engineering perspective, this is a big machine. The previous one, the proton synchrotron, you saw those tunnels in that diagram. That was for the cabling. So we could take cables directly into the instruments in a central control room. You can't do that for over seven kilometer circumference. So this was the first one where they had to start digitizing signals locally and then running a network and serial data back into a control room. And this led to a very interesting uh, invention. Um, and I can't remember if they mentioned it in the video, but it's, it's the capacitive touchscreen. So you've all got one in your pockets. It was invented at CERN. Uh, not quite the density of the touchscreen you have now, um, but so the, the first one was there. And there's a fantastic video about this, which I'm now going to play for you. More than 10,000 things to control, 7,000 things to measure, and 30,000 stators to survey, distributed over more than 10 square kilometers. That was a problem which faced the controls group. Some of these things are distributed around the ring tunnel, such as vacuum pumps, beam monitors, and magnets. Other things to be controlled are in the various auxiliary buildings on the surface. There are power supplies of many types and sizes. water circulating systems to cool the magnets and other components. And radio frequency amplifiers that supply the power to accelerate the protons. To bring all the controls and indications back to the panels in the control room, as has been done in the past, would not only involve many thousands of kilometers of cables, but would require hundreds of meters of control racks and probably bicycles for the operators. To avoid such a situation and to allow the operator to control the machine from a desk, it must be possible to connect any part of the equipment to a few controls and indicating devices according to the action that is to be carried out. This is done by touch buttons, not the usual push buttons, but a new device which can present up to 16 buttons at a time, with legends written on the face of a television screen. A first choice of the system to be worked on can be made by putting a finger over the button when the legend will change, giving a further choice. It can be likened to a tree, where the first choice is the system or branch, 
the next the subsystem or twig, the next the sort of action desired or leaf. At the leaf stage all the conditions are set up to do the specified job. The operator may be given a list of things he can control from which he can make a choice using the ball to move a cursor. And then use the knob to change the setting at some distant device. shown a mimic diagram from which he can choose the part he wants to operate. Using a ball to position a cursor and then perform the required action by touching a series of buttons. I'm quite impressed by how many different types of human control interface they have on that touchscreen. Uh, you've got a trackball, you've got a, a dial, I mean, uh, presumably there's an air pipe you blow through and a foot pedal. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so yes, uh, surprisingly, capacitive touchscreen has come from CERN. Um, so then they built the large electron positron collider. Now this was the forerunner to the LHC. This is the big tunnel that the LHC is in. Uh, so it's around 100 meters deep, the tunnel. Um, it butts up to the end of the Jura mountain range. It's actually built slightly on the tilt to avoid a different type of uh, rock that would be very difficult to tunnel through. Um, and you can see how much bigger it is than the SPS. So it's 27 kilometer uh, circumference there. Um, 5, 000, over 5,000 magnets and 100 accelerating cavities. It's a very big machine. Uh, and this was turned off in 2000 to then take everything out of the tunnel and put bigger magnets in uh, for the LHC, which started up in 2008. Um, again, 1,500 magnets, because it's the same size, it's the same ring, but these magnets were superconducting, so in a huge bath of liquid helium, which means that their resistance, uh, not only for the magnet wire, but also the wire feeding them, which runs a very long distance, um, they uh, have very, very little resistance at all. Uh, this requires 150 tonnes of liquid helium, uh, which is a scarce commodity now compared to how it used to be. 120 megawatts to power it all. Produces 140 terabytes of data per day. Um, and as we said, it goes up to 14 tera electron volts. There's a current project to increase the luminosity, so not the energy, they've already done that, but this is the amount of particles that will be colliding at once. And that basically means there's more light into their cameras, there's more collisions, so they can do more science uh, more quickly. And then there's the big news recently, the Future Circular Collider. Now this is CERN's sort of champion project for uh, after the LHC and for the future of European particle physics. Uh, 90 kilometer uh, circumference will go underneath Lake Geneva, um, be p potentially fed by the, the LHC. Um, the, uh, will be built in two stages, a bit like the previous LEP LHC. So the first would be FCC EE, this is electron electron. So it would be an electron machine, and then that would run uh, from the mid-2040s uh, up to the 2070s, where we'd switch it for a heavier hadron machine that can do protons and ions. A bit more, 880 tonnes of liquid helium. Uh, very impressively, a similar power consumption to the LHC due to these advances in, in superconductors from CERN. So now we'll go on to some of the technology that falls out. Hopefully you're feeling quite educated on what's at CERN. Uh, some computing power they used to have. So one of their first computers uh, was a Ferranti Mercury. Um, I'm not an expert in, in history of computing, but here's some nice shots for people who are. Um, and they had a CDC 6600, both mainframe computers, and then finally their Cray XMP that brought a bit of color into their uh, server rooms uh, in 88. And then, around 1995, NASA brought these Beowulf uh, low-cost PC cluster supercomputers um, and CERN sort of took a hold of that and ran with it at the time. So I think they were one of the, the, the second or third users of big BOF clusters. Um, and then nowadays, 10,000 servers plus 450,000 cores. Um, the amount of data increases year on year at such a rate. Um, and in addition to the people who work on site at CERN, most of CERN's 
um, uh, collaborators are users who are based at universities around the world analyzing the data. Um, so CERN makes use of, they have another data center in Hungary, um, and then from there they go on fiber backbones around the world. In the UK it runs over Janet and Super Janet academic uh, fiber networks. Um, so at Harwell campus, which is where Diamond is, there's SDFC's computing center, and that's where the data streams straight in from CERN. It's stored on uh, servers in there. If you do a tour, which you can do, I, I thoroughly recommend it, uh, there's a little sticker on a server that says Higgs boson found here, um, because I think the final result they used on the computation, so the statistical computation, was kept on that. Uh, and of course, it sat there for a while, because they have to do all the analysis. So the conclusive result was still on there, um, but it, you know, it sits there for a while for them to do all of that analysis. CERN IT Innovations. The original way of getting data around at CERN was a bicycle, taking tapes around the site. And when it went to collaborators, it got shipped. Um, so CERN developed uh, CERNnet, which was a two megabit LAN in 1976. A lot of institutions were doing their own things then because the industry didn't really decide what it wanted to do back then. There were lots of different offerings. Um, in 88, CERN organized the IP address allocation in Europe. Um, and uh, in 89, they formed the CIXP, the Internet Exchange Point, uh, which included the first transatlantic data link to the USA, to Cornell. Um, so in 91, 80% of Europe's internet traffic went through CERN. Here's a network diagram, and CERN is the big thing in the middle. Uh, we've got countries like Russia, America, uh, UK. Um, on the top right, this is the uh, CERNnet card, and you may just be able to make out uh, the, the photos, the mug shots from the staff badges, they used to put on their PCBs uh, from their group. So. <laughs> um, everybody probably knows the internet was born at CERN. Tim Berners-Lee with his next workstation. Um, 1989, he did that proposal. Um, he took a, this hypertext model for linking documents and said, well, could we put that uh, as a way of retrieving documents over a network? Um, and invented HTTP, um, and then the systems that were required to support that. Um, uh, since then, CERN's done an awful lot with electronics um, and, and open hardware electronics, so they created the Open Hardware Repository in 2011. Um, most of the users of the OHWR are particle accelerators and science institutes, but what's fell out of that that a lot of other people use is the Open Hardware License, the CERN Open Hardware License. So people like uh, Adafruit who make kits, lots of other open source projects um, uh, used to use the CERN one. They've got their own uh, an alternative one they use now. Um, some e examples of other projects, open source beer um, and the Satnog Satellite Ground Station, uh, both uh, open hardware license. And I think it's into the thousands now, the, the projects that use it. So it's very, very useful. So um, <clears throat> an example of open hardware which CERN uses uh, is the White Rabbit timing system. Um, so uh, these accelerators, because they're synchrotrons, they have to be very synchronized across this uh, whole system, triggering magnets, uh, aligning RF uh, frequencies for accelerating the beam in lots of separate cavities. Um, and so they uh, wanted to improve the precision time protocol, the network-based time synchronization protocol. Um, and they did that. Uh, don't ask me how they did it, but there are lots of papers you can read uh, about how they did it. But they now have sub-nanosecond accuracy, um, and you can get 10 picosecond or better jitter across the sites. Um, recently, this was incorporated into an IEEE standard. Um, so this is all open source hardware. Anyone can build them and sell them. Um, and, uh, and lots of companies have taken up doing it which is really good, that's the result they wanted. Uh, KiCad, KiCad, uh, show of hands here, people who use KiCad, KiCad, quite a lot of people, which is brilliant. Um, so CERN didn't invent or write KiCad, um, but they joined in in 2014 to support its development because uh, they really wanted something that was easier to collaborate across sites and different people with, rather than being bought into a particular manufacturer's uh, EDA suite. So this is electronics design software. Um, so they put a huge amount of effort into um, pulling KiCad through the, the last few versions. Um, they had a donation scheme which supported the project, which had just switched to a different model, but they're still very much supporting it. Um, and so, yeah. Um, they do a lot with KiCad. Um, they design their own uh, chips and sensors as well, so it's not just racks of electronics, they also design chips. Um, and one thing they have to do are these pixel detectors for these huge cavern, cavernous detectors that they do the particle physics with are formed of many, 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 many sensors. Um, and they take the technology for developing those and they push it out into the real world 
not just the particle physics world that we live in over there, um, <laughs> uh, for using, uh, using medical imaging. Um, so these Medipix and Timepix sensors are very widely used. Uh, another cool application they're working on at the moment, transporting antimatter. So one part of the CERN complex, which was on the map earlier, but I didn't have time to mention, is um, an antimatter decelerator, which is a very cool name. Um, so it turns out once you get to high energies, it's quite easy to create antimatter if you know how to do it. Um, and we want to be able to study how that interacts with matter and what differences there are between matter and antimatter. Um, and so to do that, we want to be able to trap it and probe it. So we take this thing that's running at a very high energy and we have to slow it down. We need a decelerator. And this was something that was invented uh, at CERN uh, many years ago, something called stochastic cooling. And what you do is you take your beam you want to decelerate and you run another beam next to it, and typically an electron beam, um, and it essentially gives its energy up to the other beam. And that causes the, the beam that you want to slow down to slow down. Um, you can do this many times in a ring. Um, and then finally, you can get it into a trap. So you can actually completely stop it with electric fields and, and, and optical fields. Um, and then you can uh, freeze it there. And they do that in, in the uh, decelerator. Um, but there's two reasons why they want to move it to other places once they've produced it. Um, one is that we have another building that wants to use it and has a lot of equipment in it, uh, so they want to be able to move it between the site. Um, the other reason is some of the measurements they want to do need very, very magnetically uh, quiet environments. And particle accelerators are not magnetically quiet environments. They're completely the opposite. Um, so they want to be able to take them to very nice labs with lots of concrete and water and things that absorb stray fields, um, which is not what we have here. Um, and uh, so what they've done is they've invented this <laughs> um, container you put on a HGV that contains antimatter. So the Dan Brown books are starting to get more accurate now. <laughs> um, and you know, whether this will have more guarding than a nuclear flask convoy, convoy I don't know. <laughs> but, um, uh, it's certainly not, very, not dangerous in any respect. But, you know, um, so yes, a portable generator, um, uh, probably liquid helium systems, uh, all of this sort of thing. Um, it's going to be challenging enough transporting it just a few hundred meters around the road. Um, but they also potentially want to get it into the middle of Germany. So uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how far they get with that. Uh, superconductor advances. So these superconducting magnets need these very low uh, resistance superconducting cables. Another user for that is potentially electric flight. So for electric propelled, uh, propelled um, civil aviation, which Airbus is interested in, uh, it's a 500 kilowatt powertrain. Uh, for running the, the propellers, uh, running the engines, which is a lot of power. Now, if you were going to move that from the energy storage to the, to the motors with conventional cables, they'd be very big and very heavy and very expensive. So instead, with the superconducting cables, you're a, a massive fraction uh, of uh, the size of the normal conducting cables, and much, much lighter. So there's a collaboration to produce the superconducting cable motors and wires. And yes, this does mean that the jet planes will have liquid helium uh, flowing around them to keep the cables cool, which is cool in itself. Um, and the final bit of uh, very cool tech to show is CERN has a particle detector in space uh, on the ISS. Um, it's called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It's very similar to the particle detectors it has underground. Um, this effectively is like one of the big cavernous detectors, but turned vertical in this picture. Um, I've included a banana to scale for help, uh, for scale to help. Um, uh, and you can see a, a simulated particle track through, and we've got, these are all of these different uh, sensors, CCDs, other pixels, to detect the energy and where the particle is. Um, what's really cool about this mission, there, there are lots of cool facts about it. Um, so we tested it with the SPS beam in the machine. Um, it was the final launch of Endeavour Space Shuttle, which was the penultimate space shuttle mission ever. Um, they have the control room at CERN, uh, controlling it up in space. Um, and they've recently done spacewalk missions to upgrade parts of it. And I have a really fun video of my favorite, but there's hours of this spacewalk video. You can go online and watch it. It's really funny. There's all sorts of hilarious bits in there. Um, but this is the best bit for me, which is, so he's got his space Makita, um, and he's taking the cover off the upgrade module, and he's got to get rid of the cover. But they don't have bins in space, 
Um, so actually what they do instead is they use the Earth as a bin. Um, and they just throw it down to burn up in the atmosphere. <laughs> And there's a space makita, and he suddenly realised he wants to take a picture. So he's like, oh, crap, crap, crap. <laughs> I think he's missed his moment now <laughs> with his space, uh, space Nikon camera. Um, so <laughs> but yes, I watched a lot of that video <laughs> to find that. Uh, so finally, for me, I mentioned at the beginning, there were some job opportunities. Um, working at CERN is amazing. It's a really great place to work. The people are incredible. It's very social. You meet people from all over the world. Um, and, uh, and there's so much going on. Um, the, the work itself is very interesting. It's cutting edge equipment. Um, uh, it's, there's an awful lot of freedom about you know, ways of going about things, how you want to do projects. It's a really, really um, you know, a, a supportive and encouraging place to work. There's two positions available in 2025. Yes, that's far away, but if you want to come and work there, you have to move to Geneva. So it's good to have this sort of uh, notice. Uh, one's an early career position aimed at um, sort of uh, uh, graduates, that sort of area. Um, one's a general staff position. These are both really for technician roles. Um, so debugging, developing electronics, um, cabling, things like that. Working in the tunnels um, and upgrading the accelerators. There'll be a lot of that. Um, there's training available on the job. Um, but what we're really looking for are, for are enthusiastic people um, who are really interested in electronics and debugging and, you know, half of this field, basically. Um, so um, I have the job description on an NFC tag on my badge, so please come and see me, I guess, in the Q&A tent after the talk um, if you want to scan my badge. Um, so I think that's about 50 minutes, so thank you very much.